Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining. Um, my name is Siddharth Kajuria. Uh, I'm a cultural producer and programmer, a parent, a photographer and other things too. Um, at the moment I manage an experimental socially focused public program of events and projects at the Barbican Arts Centre in London. I'm also the co-founder of Grand Plan, a new charity which awards three £1,000 grants a month to artists of colour to realise any kind of creative project. Um, I just wanted to say a little bit about this evening. The topic that I was keen to explore is uncertainty and in particular how we sustain space for the uncertain and the unknown in the context of larger scale cultural organizations, which by definition are often quite keen on organizing and classifying. Um, I was invited to give a talk by myself, but very quickly realized that I wanted and perhaps even needed a conversation which would be characterized by some of the uncertainty and reflective spirit that I wanted to discuss. Um, so a week or so ago, I met with three people, Razia Jordan, Penny Rafferty and Jonathan May, whose work and way of looking at the world I admire. And I think maybe because it was a Saturday morning and it was a sunny Saturday morning, um, we had a, a questioning open ended journey around this topic of sustaining uncertainty. And in it, we touch on a range of questions. Um, we talk about what motivates the way that we work, how you navigate feelings of being an outsider within institutions, how you resist the flattening of identities, which is so often affected, even implicitly encouraged by the way we're expected to move through organizational spaces. And I think at the heart of it is a question about how we find the edges of places and become friends with the chaos that sometimes lies there. Um, we circle around those questions, sometimes explicitly, but often implicitly. And it's worth saying that there aren't any definitive answers. I don't think our conversation has those. It's just a group of people thinking out loud and on their feet in response to a theme. And one thing I wanted to say before we start is that in this conversation, I felt like we had a choice between, on the one hand, getting into case studies and being quite specific around those, and on the other, sort of delving into a series of ideas and more open questions, and we chose the latter. But in an effort to complement some of the uncertainty and perhaps uh, lack of specificity that you can find in a conversation like that, we've compiled a list of links to essays and projects uh, with which the participants have been involved or even inspired by. And you can find them on the event page for this conversation on the AND website. And lastly, just before we start, um, Penny, one of the panelists and me, are going to be here for a conversation with Luke Moody, um, Abandoned Normal Devices Creative Director. Um, and that'll begin in about an hour or so's time. So really hope to see some of you then. Um, but for now, I think George, hiding backstage somewhere from the uh, A&D team, is about to hit play on the conversation. Um, OK, we should do some introductions. So uh, I know some of you, but I know everyone doesn't know everyone. So I'm Siddharth, Sid. Uh, I am a tall Indian man with short black hair, a blue top, uh, sitting against a white background with, um, with half a moon made out of papier-mâché on the wall behind me. Uh, and then I'm going to ask Razia, could you introduce yourself next? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Razia Jordan. Um, I'm a small brown woman with long black hair sitting in my green living room today. Um, and my pronouns are she, her. Yes, I, I go by the pronouns he and him. Sorry, I should have said that as well. Penny, I can see you next. Sure. Uh, I'm Penny Rafferty. Um, my pronouns are she, her. I'm a white woman with freckles, green eyes, open hair, and I'm sitting next to a bookcase. And Jonathan. Uh, yeah, hello. Um, my name's Jonathan, um, Jonathan May. I am a, a white man of average height, I suppose. Um, I have um, short, mousy brown hair, wearing a green top. I'm sat in my mother-in-law's um, spare room at the moment with a bookcase behind me and a rocking horse next to me that, you, um, that can't be seen. <laughs> and my, um, and the pronouns I use are he, him. 
Um, I am really aware that I know all of you to different extents. Some of you know each other, some of you don't know each other. Um, and actually, we're going to find out who each other are through a conversation. So we'll just, I think we should just dive in a little bit. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not going to try and introduce this too much. I'm going to start by asking some questions. So I'm going to like, I'm going to dive into a conversation. Um, and the way we're going to do this is I'm going to spend a bit of time talking to Razia and then to Penny and then to Jonathan. Um, and we're going to, I think, stare at the same theme from different directions and different perspectives. Um, and I think we'll stay with each of those perspectives for five or 10 minutes. Um, and I'm really keen to see which threads emerge. I think it's worth saying that we we haven't had this conversation as a group before. I've got a sense that there's some shared interest in it, but I'm really aware that we like we're all in slightly different contexts. So I'm going to stay with each of like stay with some individual conversations for a little while, and then and then we'll see where the overlaps are and explore some of them together. But I'm going to I think we should just dive in. So I'm going to I'm going to start by chatting to Raz. I'm going to look at the time as well, actually. Okay, there we go. Um, Raz, hi. Hi. Oh, Raz, yeah. um, I'm always, I never like the question, what do you do? So I'm going to ask it slightly differently. Okay. Um, what are you thinking about? Uh, what kinds of things do you think about in your work? And what are some of the contexts in which you have worked? Okay. Um, so... Maybe I'll start with some of the context and then you can remind me about the earlier questions because <laughs> it might be easier. Um, so um, I, I guess recently I've started calling myself a cultural producer and curator. And I think I am just doing that because it feels like the most legible way of doing that. I'm not, I don't think those terms are necessarily perfect, but in terms of some of the work I've done and context that have led me to that title, um, I guess I've been working in the arts for over 10 years now, and I've mostly worked in creating public programmes. So either for institutions, uh, public institutions, sorry, arts institutions, or um, I also worked for a small charity working in East London in, in community settings. Um, and that, you know, I've been doing stuff that ranges from kind of interpretation for younger, uh, for children and younger people, youth programmes, those kind of things, to um, opening community centres and um, artist led businesses. And then sort of now in my most recent job at the Welcome Collection, where I've just started, I'm working in a museum context and with the collection for the first time. Um, so yeah, that's kind of some of the contexts I've worked in that are like in the obvious sense. Um, could you remind me about the other parts of the question? Just so yeah, I, can... I think um, what are some of the I guess what I'm saying is what are some of the values that inform the way you've worked in those contexts? Yeah, um, I think I started over the last little while to really be able to see some of those values in play, and I don't think I've always known them or had an intent set a, a really specific intention around them but they've sort of through having an unconventional way of of having this career in terms of not studying art history not knowing that this is exactly what I wanted to do not even knowing what the job what a curator did or what kind of jobs in the arts were I have sort of just been figuring it out figuring it out on the fly and 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 so I've been doing things in a way that have felt really intuitive and um for me sorry just like you know I've been doing things that I thought okay this feels like the right thing at this moment or I care about this in my real life why wouldn't I want to do it like this at work and those kind of things and so recently I've realized though that 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 isn't always easy for everyone and not everyone you know orientates themselves around their work in that in that way they have other motivations or they have a simpler way of thinking about things but um I think some of my values are I'm always thinking about like I'm always thinking about a couple of things like value and quality and inequality in general and the feeling of bit, the feeling of being on the outside and the inside and I mean these aren't exactly values but I'm just telling you some of the things that I think about that hopefully inform some of the approaches that I take to how I create projects and programs mm -hmm. They're kind of things and I'm thinking about and in terms of like principles and things like that I don't have kind of like an you know a sort of rigid code or anything but I do I have always 
had like this sense that I want to work towards you know bringing more people along that are like me and a sense of justice and I think in a different life I would have been like an investigative journalist or something (laughs) or a detective which is my favorite genre um, of literature so I think I've always just always been felt like an outsider which has given me this ability I think to stay instinctive to keep asking questions to never really be sort of fully invited in and part of the fold and then try to use that to my advantage I don't know if that answered your question it does and also it it also brings to the surface like listening to you these tensions that you're straddling between like my real life and my work life and being an outsider but being inside these places and I think a lot of what I'm hoping for from some of this conversation is I don't think there's an answer, a definitive answer to that. How do we sustain uncertainty? But I think for me, it speaks to there's a there's a tension that you're straddling that's already implicit in the way you're talking about it. And I guess the question I want to ask you is if if you think, and I think you think it is quite important to have space for the uncertain and some of some of like those different ways of being in the spaces you find yourself. How do you make space for it in your day-to-day existence at work? Um, I think I'm just trying to learn how to do that all the time. And I think for a long time, I felt like uncertainty meant kind of being unworthy or inexperienced or those kind of things. When actually uncertainty, you know, I think people have started to realise now saying that you don't know something or saying you're not sure or saying you feel uncomfortable about something doesn't mean necessarily that it's a bad thing in a situation or a collaboration. Um, And actually in the arts, I think a lot of the time we don't like that uncertainty. We're not very good at evaluation. We're not very good at those kind of things. And actually, if we were to live in some of more of those in certain areas, I think we would be able to be more honest with each other. Um, I think there's a tension of always wanting to create the best, right? You want to, mm. with, when you're, when you're making art or me, whatever, um, or you've got a responsibility because you've got public funding and you have to provide a resource, you know, for, for a group, for an audience, you've got this real sense of responsibility, which is really, really good. But how do you square that with the need for uncertainty so that you can hold a space where, something might happen one way or it might not and you can hold space for like natural evolutions in people and projects and I feel like sometimes the professionalism of the industry um, in some ways obviously is good we don't want precarity but the professionalism in terms of how we interact with each other can get in the way and it's kind of counterintuitive to the work that we're actually doing and there Mm. feels to be like a divide between the people that make things happen and the people that are makers which I'm not saying that um it's like on an individual basis I just think in a wider sectoral thing like it feels like there's the people that make stuff and can be creative and can be themselves and and then there's the people that make it happen and actually I think it's nicer when we can try and break some of those I'm really struck by your use of the word professionalism in that. And I guess I wanted to ask you, can you think about if there are conversations you've been in uh, that have been leading to the making of a project, what have the best ones been characterised by? What have they had in them? Hmm. Um, I think they've had, they've definitely had that thing where one group of people or one person isn't being kind of deferent to the other where there does seem to be a genuine unknown between you in terms of the thing you're creating so for example if you were work, you know like I was working with a sculptor not making a sculpture with that sculptor to just use a, um, an annoying example but like so where there's something that you are, but like both parties are genuinely like excited about creating something. It doesn't have to be new for the world, but new-ish to you both, right? Or what you're creating. I think that's really great when that happens. I think another one is when, yeah, similar to that, but where you're sort of learning something. I'm always learning from the people I work with because I don't see myself as an expert in anything. And I don't mean that in a way to be 
not confident in myself I just mean I don't have this one specialism and actually I feel like when you have someone else who's a bit comfortable about being that person as well or when they're like not that kind of expert I feel like that's really nice as well those kind of projects um and I know we can send some links later maybe to people but there's um yeah there's a project I guess the unclaimed project that um me and you worked on Sid was definitely example of that and I think if people read about that they'd see a little bit what I mean about the different agencies involved like um and how we all work together and what the end result how the end result represents that mixture of approaches hopefully so yeah I think and actually I want to say that now it I don't know that there's time in 45 minutes, 50 minutes to both talk about projects and talk about ideas. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do with this is, I think the people watching are are a mix of, I know from talking to the Ant team, a mix of producers, curators, artists, practitioners. And I am hopeful that this dialogue is kind of an insight into some of the energy and perspective Um, people are bringing to conversations that are leading to cultural projects but it's not definitive Um, and what we're what you'll find I don't know where on the internet but we'll we're going to have a little list of projects things that the people in this room have been involved in so if you want to join some of the dots between the ideas in here and what it looks like when it becomes a thing in the world uh, you'll be able to one last question for you Raz and then I'm gonna start asking Penny some questions um I'm nervy about the balance between the theoretical and the practical in a chat like this. I want to ask you a practical question. Um, you've talked to me in the past about like how important it is to try and buck the system like, in certain contexts. How do you go about or what advice would you have for someone who feels like they're in a system that needs bucking or subverting or sort of like demystifying if they find themselves within mm, it? Like how they should go, how, how they might go about that. Um... I guess for me, because I'm like a middle child, because I'm a bit of an annoying little sister. <laughs> it just comes natural to me, so I don't know how to advise. No, that definitely. But also also being kind of, you know, working class brown woman in the arts, a lot of the time when I'm just being myself and communicating in the way that I do, a lot of the time I'm just bucking the system and I notice the kind of misunderstandings happen between me and other types of people and that's fine and and obviously we usually get over that and it's um all part of as humans trying to relate to each other but I think I'm trying to think back to how I would practically advise someone to maybe do something like that I think try and find your people so I think whether you have you're in a team of eight people or 800 there is going to be someone and there's going to be someone on some level that sees you and wants to help and wants to achieve some of the the change or some of the some of the way like some of the ways that you want to achieve stuff they'll want to do that with you and to even though when you feel a little bit lonely you're probably you're really not like I don't mean it in a like self-help way I just mean it in a practical way that we're all multitudes of people and at first you're not going to see that in a lot of your colleagues especially when you're being hit by maybe some some walls or something because of different practices and things like that and I think I've had to learn that to look deeper and wait and try and find those people and not just be so quick to hear one no or see one person that maybe you don't connect with and not sort of take that as a as a given for every situation so that would be a practical thing I think. Thank you I love that the first part of the answer was be a scrappy middle child. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, Oh, cheers. Um, I am going to, uh, there's so many more questions I want to ask and I've scribbled notes, but I'm going to move on to Penny to ask some more questions. Um, Penny, hello. Hey. Um, uh, you, <laughs> I feel like everyone here has slightly different hats and a number of them, and I feel like you've got a lot of different hats in your cupboard. Um, could you tell us a little bit about, um, yeah, what your... What kind of, what do you think about and how how does that inform the different hats that you wear? Mm -hmm. Clearly I'm spending most of this conversation trying to not ask what do you do, but really I am asking (laughs) what do you do? Uh, So 
I mean, I, I think what Rasia just said, like also really resonated with me because I think a lot of what I try to do is like getting the right people in the room with me. Uh, so I am in, in all fairness, a collective practitioner. <laughs> um, and mm, well, I sort of have these two sides, um, but they both resonate inside, I guess, like an interest to ask questions about consensual reality, about how we organize consensual reality, who has the authority to make reality, and how can we do it better? Um, and so that kind of manifests itself into a peer-to-peer decentralized autonomous organization, uh, which I co-founded with a number of other people here in Berlin, um, predominantly working with Callum Bowden and Lara Lati, but there's like a lot of other people in the mix, um, which is basically a way to change resources and art making um, by actually putting the resources into the hands of the user as opposed to having this kind of gift economy from institutions, patrons, um, councils that then can only ever become like a feedback loop of gratification from the artist because uh, of course we are in scarcity um, resources and so to try to kind of like actually level the playing field between artists and between the resources and how these are also relevant and this also means that looking a lot at artists who maybe aren't readily accepted into these systems as well um, because I think that like although the art world right now and the makings of the art world is like this multitude of, I don't know, like hyper-dimensional circuits and of like solid state matter, but then it's painting, sculpture, performance, you know, and it doesn't like really kind of resonate, I think, any longer. So a lot of this work is about, I don't know, like kind of breaking new space and catching up to like the potential of art. And I think that art is a little bruised, but I do really, really believe in it. Um, maybe that's naive, mm -hmm. but I think that like art in itself has a potential to change us and like, through like social evolution, through learning, through trial and error. Um, and then my other part, <laughs> I guess, is that I also work with um, another collective called Arm Social Club and we create um, like immersive role-playing environments within the art world that live for anywhere between like eight hours or 38 days was the longest one we did. And that's about kind of world crafting or terraforming, like potential other landscapes so that people can, well, in a way like understand like what an unreliable narrator is, what like collective authorship is and like how do we actually manifest this this landscape that we find ourselves in. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, it's similar to hearing Raz introduce herself, just hearing you talk about what's informing your work. I'm really struck by the sort of tension and multiple relationships you're trying to hold and sustain. And I want, it makes me want to ask you, what is your relationship with not even just uncertainty, but maybe chaos. Like what you're describing implies a bit of chaos. Like what is your relationship with uncertainty and chaos and where does it come from? I mean, I think I've always like found kind of kinship with chaos. Um, maybe also like coming a little bit from what you were saying, Razia, because I've always 
been living in chaos. Like I had very chaotic upbringing within like both myself and also um, like the world that I was born into, I guess. Um, and I found out pretty early on that like unless you actually like become one with it and become like kind of malleable and fluid and like, almost taking on this role of the trickster and like hustle and like where where are you what can you move and I think that like when one begins to like become friends with chaos, like all these like really exceptional things can open up to you and it's no longer terrifying. And I think that this is something as well that I try to, I guess, present to people that I like meet along my life, which is pretty chaotic. <laughs> But that in a way, I, I think that our fear of chaos and also like coming like from, um, I guess like this sense of chaos magic as well as being a practitioner of this is like also very much about like, how do you begin to see this chaos and be able to kind of utilize it to actually work for you and to reveal things between your life and the decisions that are being made that are out of your control. And I think that a lot of the reason why we are taught to fear chaos, or at least to really not like it, is because when, when we're afraid of it, we want somebody else to take that away from us. And that usually means that they have power over us because they're actually, I mean, think about it when you were like a little kid and you like, there's someone says, oh, you don't have the knowledge or you don't have the skill set. here, let me do it. Or like when the, the bank's like, hey, no, you, you can't uh, manage this loan agreement, let me do it. Or like, you know, even, what we do out on the street or, you know, things like this. It's like, you actually give up a lot of your own autonomy when you're afraid of like uncertainty. And I think that that's something that comes from like maybe even not only a political pretense, but we could also say that that's like very systemic to uh, certain religions as well. Um, and that's also, I think you can map these things inherently to the oppression of certain types of people. Penny, how do you, how do you sustain the sort of spirit that has informed the way you're talking in the last few minutes in the context of an organizational structure? And like, I know that you exist independent of, but you also do exist like really adjacent to the more formal art world. Like, how do you, how do you sustain who you are and the way you're talking alongside some of those structures? Uh, tricky. <laughs> like, I, oh, this is good. I can't think of like a non-cynical way to say this. <laughs> like, um, I, and I'm very aware that this is like, not like just us talking, but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna be, I'm blushing. I'm gonna be, I'm gonna say it. Um, I think that, I think you can, in the art world, it's pretty interesting that you can actually often play to not be in the status quo. And like, as soon as you feel comfortable about being the weirdo in the room, it's fine. And I think that, they, that actually you can, and I guess maybe this is also my connection or like relationship with this chaos that I was speaking of earlier. This is, I think, also a little bit the same thing of like, instead of being like, oh, I'm the only one who's thinking like this in the room, I like actually see that as an advantage. Because I think that one thing that that, art world is fertile for is 
new ideas or ideas that don't necessarily all sit together very neatly and that there is tensions and there is differences. And I think that probably more than anywhere else in the world, like art can actually offer that up. Mm. Like there should be differentiating opinions because that's actually kind of whole point of art is that we have like this kind of multitude of objects, practices, statements, theories. And so I think like by being, being different is actually kind of, no, I don't want to say being different is easy in the art world, but it's somehow maybe easier if you begin to see it as a strength, I guess. Okay. Thank you. That's a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't <laughs> I was half expecting you to go, uh, yeah, you can't. That didn't come across as a cynical answer at all, um, what you did wind up saying. Um, I am going to start looking at Jonathan for a moment. Um, hi, Jonathan. Hello. <clears throat> Hello. Um, can you tell me about your hats and why you wear them? <laughs> you see my hats. Um, I have a multitude of hats. Raz, when, when Raz was talking about um, figuring out on the fly what you do, it profoundly resonated. Because um, I think um, I went through a stage of, of, of thinking about myself as a producer. Um, and I think that was when I started working in a festival. I, I happened to manage to make my way to working into a festival. And and I saw that there were loads of producers having loads of the conversations that I wanted to have. And I was like, oh, that's it. I want to be a producer. That's what a producer is. You know, I grew up, my, my mum worked in childcare. My dad worked in Bull's Ice Cream Factory until he was laid off and then he was unemployed. I didn't know what a producer was. I didn't have a clue. I had, I grew up in a, in a town where there wasn't a, where there wasn't a gallery. There was, um, there was one theatre, but it had some really dodgy stuff. And I mean dodgy, when, I really mean dodgy when I say dodgy. Um, and um. So I, I didn't know anything about the art world. I didn't know anything about, about these cultural spaces. There weren't books in my house. I grew up with um, music and film and TV and, 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 um, and throwing parties with my friends in, in, in random places. And, um, and so I never once thought about what, what, what a producer was. So I went for a little while I started talking, talking about myself as a producer. For a little while I started talk, um, flirting with the idea of thinking about myself as a, as a, as a curator. I've also kind of, I settled for a while on cultural programmer. Um, I think today I'm going to refer to myself as a cultural Swiss army knife. So I think that's probably the best way of describing, um, just, just describing how I, how I have, how my career maybe has, has, has evolved. Um, in that I have, I've worked in fundraising. I've worked in comms for festivals. I've, I've done a lot of um, kind of community and exchange based work. Um, I've commissioned um, um, a, a lot of work. I've directed a festival. I've um, spent a lot of time um, working as an arts programmer, specifically with the British Council, um, developing um, collaborative exchanges and, and, and contexts for, um, for different cultures to, to meet each other. And, and all of this stuff is, is inherently um, cross disciplinary because I think I realised that I don't know how much I'm I don't know how much I'm interested in things like the art world and and art sectors. I'm, I'm interested in how businesses and how organisations and how people organise themselves mm. to achieve um, to achieve goals. Um, I've definitely stayed. I've definitely been mainly in a subsidised sector, I suppose, um, or, or or a sector that's underpinned by by subsidy. Um, which which is interesting for me to to clock and reflect on, but um, I think the the bulk of my work has always been I think instinctively I've always been drawn to finding the edge of 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 a context that I'm working in. So if I'm in a festival um, that is focused on predominantly on theatre, then I will be really interested in going and chatting to record labels or talking to um, um, or, 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 or talking to a very specific community of practice, be it a dockyard or, or the people that work around, um, um, yeah, any, any kind of particular practice that is not in any way in the arts world and seeing what happens when, when conversations bridge those and what kind of cultural projects and products and dialogues um, and events can come from that. Um, and I think, I'm drawn to I'm drawn to the experiential. I think because I'm interested in those in those kinds of um, unpredictable conversations, um, and 
yeah, and I think th- those are those are the those are the those are probably the best coordinates to stake yeah. out. At this stage. I like the word right. coordinates. Right. I think I'm realizing why I don't want to ask what you do is that what do you do invites an answer that goes. I know. I'm a title at this place. Yeah. I'm a title at this place, and it always masks like a bucket load of thinking and uncertainty and tension. And I, I guess one of the things that interests me in this conversation is like there's so much more truth in in all of that unresolvable tension uh, than the hi, I'm the head of marketing at Tate or hi I'm a curator at, you know because you could have introduced yourself as hi John I'm Johnson I was festival director and and I am program manager at council oh that's impressive um but well, yeah it's like well, even the opposite when I let slip British council I was saying like there's a lot of connotations that come with that yeah um um you know uh, pre- presenting as a as a as a straight white male that works at British council that works in that you know that people will assume that I am um, middle class or upper middle class, that I, mm-hmm. that I am underpinned by these values, that the work I do is based on this. And people's assumptions will be different. Some of those might be positive, some of those might be negative, but they're all often very flattening. And one of the things I've really enjoyed about the conversation so far is that, um, you know, Pen- Penny, Penny I've, not, I've, I've not met before and it's been fascinating listening to you, whereas I do know um, um, a fair bit um, and Raz hasn't put in some of those markers that um, that that might fill in gaps for people um, and fi- and filling assumptive gaps of, of who she might be. And so what what, I, what I'm really enjoying about this is there's a I think anyone um, listening has to really listen to the person in front of them and not not come with those labels and those brands and those and those associations. So you can really pay attention to the practice and the person underneath, which I think is really important. Um, one of my anxieties in this conversation is that we're not answering the question, how do you un- sustain uncertainty? But I feel like hearing you talk, one of them is if you if you resist providing those markers, then you have to be in a more uncertain space. And like, I think that, that yeah, just as you were saying that, that, that really, that really stuck with me. I've got a question for you. Um, you are, um, you are someone who has been, you know, as a You've been the author of a document, the author of a festival, a person with like a fair bit of power in a room. You've also been on the receiving end of some of those like frameworks and structures and responding to it. And I guess, how do you relate to both the value of uncertainty and chaos and open-endedness in some of those uh, environments? But the flip side of that is like, when does it become dangerous? When does the like the fluidity of a dialogue like this become unsettling and unhelpful and almost like difficult for people to operate within. Okay. Um, good questions. Um, takes back a little bit to something that, that Penny was saying that I, that I found that's, that I found really, really interesting, which was about the idea of power and idea of knowledge and how power and knowledge are wielded. And, um, and I, I suppose I, I have a, I've recently found words to articulate it as I have discovered the concept of, of coaching, but I realized I, I'm, I'm a natural, I'm a, I'm a natural coach um, and have a natural coaching style to how I work with people. Um, I think, I think because of my background I, before I, um, in between working in the cultural sector and, and, and earlier on in, in my life, I worked for a union um, for, a, for two, three years. And um, so I think, there's something about something in it, I, I have something inherently ethical underpinning me, which sometimes, which I have to manage because sometimes it's useful and sometimes it's not, which is about the dis- distributing power and, um, and empowering those that have been told continually that they don't necessarily have power because they might be, you know, um, shot for factory workers or, 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 or whatever. Um, and I'm a, I'm a strong believer in community building and in, in unionizing and in, um, in um, dispelling the myth of that people are powerless. Because often the people who, um, who are perceived to have power actually are only, their power is entirely underpinned by that, by that fiction. And, is, um, and often the people who are um, characterized as um, being um, disempowered actually collectively hold hold the majority of power um especially when in the in the example of cultural institutions where um they are often trying to um do outreach rather than transform themselves and i think 
and I think that's when you talk about uncertainty and there's a obviously there's a big difference between uncertainty and precarity um but in wielding wielding power I think the biggest power that you have when you wield power is the power to be able to sit in uncertain spaces and transform yourself in response to them and I think that's often what the cultural sector and what organizations forget that they can and should do um, when trying to um, have a meaningful dialogue with an audience that they acknowledge that they have not served and should be serving. Um, and so I guess for me, you know, when I found myself in positions of power and that power can be, um, I have been given a budget that I haven't had to go out and, and um, you know, hustle for, um, that I can use in whatever, um, whatever, you know, within a certain framework, but, you know, I have the, I have the, the power and the autonomy to use. Um, I try and make sure that the people that I work with um, have as much of a hand on the steering wheel as me. Um, the flip side of that is, you know, um, d directing a festival, um, you realise that there is there is a dual tension when you are a, when when you are put in a leadership position, that sometimes you have to, you know, I, I like sustaining uncertainty. I really enjoy sustaining uncertainty. Um, I find it enriching. I find it um, exciting. Um, I love the beginnings of projects, going out, finding connections to other people, which is inherently widening uncertainty and possibility by bringing unlikely characters into a collaboration or into a commission. Um, and, and actually something that I struggle with and I have to use, I have to remind myself to use strategically because it does help, um, is to be more decisive, to make decisions. And I think when sometimes when you find yourself in a, in a, in a leadership position in an organization, leading a program, um, you can't you, you can't always sustain uncertainty because it's it's it it feels like precarity to other people, mm. especially people whose job it is to drive things forward. So um, there is a responsibility in in having that kind of power where you have to give people certainty, and especially in contexts when you're creating collaborative environments, your job is almost to stake out the certain points so that uncertainty can can thrive within it. Does that make sense? Um, thank you. Um, We've got 15 or so minutes um, to have a chat. Um, and I'm really aware that like, I've been asking questions. I've got more questions, um, but I will take a bit of a punt and I'm gonna ask Razia to warn her for a second. Um, if there is anything that you want to ask Penny or Jonathan or me or kind of just chuck into the room kind of reflecting on the way the conversation's gone um yeah oh god I've just so enjoyed listening to Penny and Jonathan um so I'm just in an enjoyment mode but um obviously there are things that really resonated with me from what they said and I think we'll get to them but I think we should ask you a question <laughs> actually so make it a bit more fair um so what question do I want to ask you um yeah from what you've heard today how has that how has that connected to kind of the idea you had when you put us three together in terms of like under this heading and I don't mean you have to explain why we're mm -hmm. relating to that but like how what has it made you hearing these three different kind of perspectives has it given you any ideas yeah it's I feel like the thing that's been gnawing away at me is that um, I'm always nervous that a conversation won't lead somewhere. Like I'm always kind of sniffing out where the momentum is and trying to sustain it and go, because it's so hard to make a conversation turn to a project. And, um, and especially like I've only worked in large cultural bureaucracies. And so I'm especially nervous of momentum getting snuffed out. And, and yet what, like, I, like, I know, I know a couple of you pretty well, Penny, I've sort of only had a couple of conversations with over the last few weeks. And what it's left me stuck with, actually, is um, how do you create, how can stuff slow down? Like, how can you, it's left me going, like, the conversations need to be slower. Like, it's, um, and so yeah I think the tension I'm stuck with I don't know how it's like how do you how do you both like preserve the momentum 
that like means a conversation can lead fruitfully towards a project and like be on budget and like you know orchestrate all of the need for knowledge and certainty that an institutional context or a multi-partner context needs how do you do that whilst also having conversations that are slow enough that allow people to bring all of the like multitudes or uncertainty that they have in their heads into that space and I think something you said at the, right at the beginning Raz was this and like you caveated it so I'm, I'm kind of slightly generalizing here but that some people have the freedom to sort of really sit with all of that and then other people I think I think they maybe do have more freedom than they realize and I think I'm like I'm wondering whether some people who often wield the power in the room, the kind of, I'm the producer, I'm the budget holder, I'm the commissioner, could maybe do more to, to like allow everybody to feel a little bit more at peace with their uncertainty. Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know if that's an answer, an answer to your question, but I think slowness, I guess my mind has gone to like, it's a Saturday morning, it's nine o'clock. It feels yeah. really easy to talk like this because I don't have a diary full of other things going on. Yeah. I'm like, how can I replicate some of the slowness of this conversation in a chat with a marketer, a researcher, a copywriter, an artist, a funder, and a senior manager who, who tend to go to meetings that begin, what do you do? And they, they kind of inhabit the meeting through their title rather than inhabit. You know, I just, I, you said, you said, Oh yeah, there's my real life. And then there's my work life. I'm like, how can there maybe be a bit more of, the real life in the meeting I think that's the question that this conversation is leaving me with um, mm. yeah. and just what you said about um with all those different people in the room how do you like hold I guess that and I think I've said to you before that I feel like if you're in a role where you're the person that's either started the conversation or for some reason you've got the money or the power you know you've got more of the power that you often as a producer as well you're the sponge for yeah. all of the different energies and all of the different modes that people have to be in to make that project happen and so sometimes that that just comes with this kind of yeah I think what you're saying about sometimes you're having to like bring it back to a document or bring it back to a meeting and bring it back to an agreement about budget and I feel like that is what I like when you're that is kind of part of the job but it does provide this kind of it can sometimes make you feel lost like hang on who am I in this project I don't, and that's just yeah. where my head went to when you said that because I feel like that a lot of the time um, I also I wonder whether like some of that can be like oh it's a loss to like myself or yourself which it definitely is but also you're often the source of energy in the room as well yeah. because like yeah you're the person who's holding the space. And if you feel slightly lost in it, or you feel like you have to be a, a sponge for, a, for an energy, like that then reflects onto other people and like can do, makes me, I'm gonna, Penny, I think there's something you talked the other day about um, the role of friendship and you called it radical friendship in the way that um, one of the organizations you're a part of like works. And, but you also said like in moments of crisis or challenge, you go to another mode. And I guess I want to like ask you, like listening to the chat Raz and me were just having, um, we are, what's the role of friendship in the way things come to be? I mean, I think that the role of, or how I envisage that like friendship comes into like workplaces is that you're allowed to be wrong in a friendship. You're allowed to make mistakes and you're also allowed to be grateful and humble of your friend. And I think that like, we don't exercise that enough when it comes to colleagues. Um, and I think that that's at least where I'm trying to like really position all of my working practices from this state of like, and it's not a state of just pure friendship because you're actually on this really difficult, a really motivated like pathway to actually make something together. So it's, it's not the friendship modus of just kind of hanging out, seeing what's happening and so forth, but like there is this like real strength and, and but with that strength, you can't forget like the, I guess the bodily experience of being together. 
um, which I think can also be, I feel like that bodily experience is very much here in this Zoom call. It, it doesn't have to be like a physical. Um, and I think also just like listening now, there was like a few things that really struck me. And I would like to ask you all a question um, <laughs> because from what I'm, I'm understanding is that like, there's a lot of facilitation of events or pieces or programs that always has this like very, very strong public component to it. And I was like very, very lucky um, if last year, no, the year before, um, with Ruth Catlow from Featherfields Gallery in London, because I'm actually based in Berlin. Um, we actually managed to convince uh, a few institutions to actually allow us to get together like 15 people to go on like a retreat, but we didn't actually have to uh, produce any format that would go public. And it was a lot about like working with decentralized autonomous organizations, like what is the commons? And we just got like this amazing bunch of people together who were thinking about these things. And we had taught like talks, just the 15 of us. And it was, it was very much like a kind of seminar or like it would have been a great program, but we just did it to each other. Um, and I'm just wondering whether like, do you feel that that could actually be more of a common practice? Because I think also like sitting in this room, and this is how I feel a lot of the time, is that we're presenting here, but like I feel that we would, if we were in a room together where we didn't have to present and we could just speak together, then I think we would actually probably start collaborating or like at least exchanging and learning from each other to actually like make more <laughs> kind of ripples in this cosmos. And so I'm just, yeah, I'm always interested, like if you feel that that would like be a viable practice to like offer up or whether you don't see sort of like any space to be able to sort of, I guess, sell that modus of working together. <laughs> I, if, I, I might take a first step. Um, what you described there made me think a lot about the difference between culture making as a product and culture making as a practice. And, um, and often when working with um, other organizations, collaborators, um, some of the most interesting, enriching um, pro projects that, that, that I've been involved in um, have been um, have been designated in those organizations. I know that those other organizations have managed to find ways of working on them because they're professional development projects. Um, and um, I'm finding myself increasingly um, less interested in, 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 in products um, and, you know, and what comes out of a project and more interested in process. And I'm thinking, and I think that's leading me to think more about educational spaces. Um, because we think that you know professional development is what we do with our team uh, or what we do um, within our organization or what we do with our with the artists that we want to work with and um, and then we make these things and then put them in front of audiences so they can sit in front of them passively or maybe be immersed in them or whatever um, but i'm yeah i'm i'm true to, true to my form of finding the edges of places to work i'm starting to wonder if I want to work within an, an educational institution to do cultural projects because I think the the aim of self-actualization, stretching oneself, um, um, yeah, being vulnerable enough to stretch to stretch oneself, like the, 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 those kind of environments. And thinking about what you're talking about, being humble, and then talking about ideas of security. And I know that something that I've learned through it being successful, and learned through it not through uh, things that I've learned through holding. Um, holding uncertain spaces successfully and holding uncertain spaces unsuccessfully is around security. Um, Cause that's when uncertainty, if, if people don't, if people aren't secure in those uncertain spaces, then it tips into precarity. Um, and I think 
uh, I'm starting to think of myself more as creating these secure spaces to be able to hold uncertainty. Um, and because you need to feel secure to be vulnerable. Um, we're taught that we, that, you know, as a very, as a very humble person um, who is often told that I can afford to have a little bit more swag. Um, I think, you know, I, I know that, I know that being confident and being, um, and, and talking about yourself confidently is important, but then I think something about humbleness and vulnerability is what allows other people in. And that's the challenge of what we've got right now, because it's hard to be vulnerable in a space like this, because being physically together is a vulnerability. Um, whereas sitting on, a, sitting, on a, sitting on a Skype call, depending where you are um, and, and your context often doesn't feel quite as, quite as vulnerable. Um, but yeah, that's, what, that's my initial response to that question. Raz, where did your head go? I think I'm still, I think I'm still processing it. Cause it's <laughs> just everything that Jonathan said in response to that great question. I'm just like, it's blowing my mind. And um, yeah, I guess picking up on that phrase that you said, creating secure places for vulnerability, um, Jonathan, I think is just so lovely. Um, and I am often wondering about that, my responsibility in creating safety for people and things and with the the job that I'm currently doing there's this kind of inherent thing about engagement in there and this kind of idea of the product the event the thing like Penny was saying the public da, 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 and how that is being looked at as inherently the point of it and I'm sort of trying to be like oh mm. I don't really want to put on any events yet I don't want to do any of that I want to think about how are we engaging with each other how are people responding to this inter this new project internally all those kind of things and that for me is probably coming from a place of knowing that I haven't had enough time to build any safety yet I haven't had enough time to build any mutual understanding yet and so where can that come from first so anyway that's just it was just because that you were yeah hearing you both talk then was just so useful for me and that's where my head went and I think Penny, what you said about um, these kind of more private ways of organising, I'm, yeah, I think I need to do more of that. I'm so shy about doing those things and I have this kind of real aversion to, like Jonathan said, this characterization of professional development. And But then also I get really weird about kind of creating cliques as well and mm. I'm a bit of an introvert. So I'm like, hang on. But then I love having conversations like this. And actually over the last few years, I have been doing more of that and have been on a couple of those styles of retreat that you've mentioned. And actually it's important that not just artists get to do that. Obviously it's really important that artists get to do that, but it, it's important for us to do that. And often we're kind of by ourselves left behind on some of that, that value, value in that. So yeah, something I'm going to take away anyway. Yeah, and I think that's what I meant when I, when I was thinking about educational spaces, because I was like, what if, what, what, what if the, the audience that, that whatever organisation or institution is, is, is um, seeking to serve um, or, 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 or be in dialogue with or be in coexistence with, how do you, how do you create those spaces for, for your audience to, um, to, to em, em, empower them to, to, um, to not necessarily to platform the artists or the organization or the culture worker, but to, but to, but to create those spaces of mutuality and mutual growth. Um, an elephant in this room for me is uh, brand and the real like shininess and cleanliness and coolness of the way in which institutions project a kind of singularity to the world. And I think there's something about culture anywhere, but especially in organizations that's really stubborn and it's very difficult to shift it. And Penny's question really left me wondering, is it possible to use the existing kind of scaffolding structure systems, ways of talking to hold and create more space for uncertainty? It kind of has to be because there's like this inextricable link between the culture that exists inside some of those art making factories and the way in which they relate to the people they collaborate with. Um, but at the same time, 
I'm like, yeah, but they're, they're just inextricably tied to like the need to create a product, have a timeline, have a title, have a, and it's like, you know, can you get far enough through subverting those or do you need to reimagine them? Jonathan said on the phone yesterday, he's like, what would a policy for uncertainty look like if an organization had one? And I got to thinking, I was like, is that, is that possible? Like, is it worth, like, could it, could it exist? Um, I feel, oh God, yeah. If we don't stop now, there's going to be no time for anyone to ask any questions. We've already like trickled a little bit over. Um, Penny, can I give you the last word? <laughs> sure. Like, is it, is it a question or should I just... No, I'm going to ask you to, in 30 seconds or so, uh, reflect, synthesize or inspire in a hopeful way about the conversation you've been in. I think that the, well, first of all, it was just also extremely inspiring just being here and also recognizing that there, there's more faces to add into that room that we spoke about. And I think that, that that room is what we're all fighting for. And I think that if there is anything that we've learned, like from the realization of like our move towards the technological, like through this last pandemic, is that there, there is a very, very strong need for not only a local, but also a translocal uh, cooperation of changing and moving and shifting and mutating like the ways in which we're working in the arts. Because I think that it's really about finding those nodes. And even if those nodes are just there for support or there to be able to troubleshoot something or there to say that something like is actually working. I think that that's really how we will be able to build this is like by building it together and making allies and pacts with people that are maybe outside of your professional brand, but like inside your home. Thank you. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, thank you for joining us for this evening's uh, resurface at Abandoned Normal Devices. My name is Luke Moody, I'm a white man with a brown moustache, joining you from a warm corridor in North London um, in an attempt to, to create a bit of an aesthetic background here. Um, so this was the final of the resurface series. The series has been an attempt to uh, create propositions, to create questions of how we work together uh, and how we look forward together uh, to new worlds. It featured Suzanne Daliwal, Hypericum Working Group, uh, Black Swan, and Daniel Brathwaite Shirley over the last five weeks. And all of those conversations, plus this one, will be available on our YouTube channel to, to rewatch. Thank you very much to our guests tonight, to Jonathan, Razia, Sid, and Penny. We're now joined again by uh, Sid and Penny uh, live. So. If you uh, want to join the conversation, please do post questions in the in the YouTube chat. We've got a couple of questions that are already present uh, that I'll try to address. We have a little bit of feedback. Um, great, it's gone. Um, so we've got about 20 minutes to dig a little deeper. And in the words of uh, Sid during the conversation, we're not trying to propose answers here or, or solutions where in a way this is the space for the unresolvables. It's a space to to think through and, and to talk through. Uh, so please do, do participate if you can. Firstly, I wanted to um, follow on from the talk with a question. Uh, the talk very much for me was, was looking at the ways that you work um, and the ways that you'd like to work. Uh, I'd like to uh, firstly ask Sid um, a little bit like what are you working in opposition to? And where where in your world do you see stasis? Where in your world do you see a friction of something that we might need to overcome together? 
Oh, it's a super interesting question. Um, it, more and more, I, I, I'm trying not to conceive of myself working in opposition to things, but almost just having the capacity to intervene. I think the two, I guess the two verbs I'd reach for are intervention and convening. And I think for a, for a good while, I used to think that I am working in opposition to existing institutions, existing structures, existing modes of classification. And I think definitely at some level I am. Like I am, I am working in opposition to the idea that, um, that our starting point for creating culture should be predefined categories of art form. Um, and so, and so I'm trying to move away from the idea that we start from a discipline or a medium and instead start from, from things that are maybe more cultural, the way we think or play or eat or work or dream. And, and so I am trying to, I am trying to develop and play a part in developing cultural projects that are born from a group of people who are interested in a cultural question. And I think inherent in that is an unknown or an uncertain practice because they don't have the ready scaffolding of, oh, would the conversations like this normally become X or normally become Y or normally have a, a box that they can fit into? Um, uh, does that answer you? Does that answer some of your question? Is that is that sort of is that yeah, some of what you were trying to get at? I think we can we can dig a little deeper with that um, later in the conversation because I'm aware that we've got a few questions in the the chat. But related to that, um, Penny, I, you operate somewhat autonomously from this world of institutions or established institutions with with a form of collectivity, with a form of independence and. Um, shifting sands in a way, purposefully shifting sands that are built into the way that you're you're operating as a collective. Um, I wanted to ask you whether that is seen as a as a, a proposed replacement for the institutional framework that we're operating within. Um, I know you mentioned in particular this, we're working in a gift economy at the moment, a, a structure that is very much top down, um, at least here within the UK organizations receive money from bodies like Arts Council. They make the decisions as to where that money is distributed through a curator, through a creative director, etc. The artists are the recipients uh, of this gift, gift economy and have very little say in, in the structure that's above them and the decisions that are above them. Do, do you see your work, Penny, as a kind of, I guess, a proposal to replace that or is that not of interest to you? Are you looking to just be independent of that world. Just be independent of that world. Just be independent of that world. Uh, thanks so much for the question. Uh, just checking quite quickly that you can hear me. Yeah. 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 Okay. Super. Um, so, firstly, I think that what we're trying to do is we're not trying to replace the system, but instead to work alongside it in order to open up some of these structures that maybe haven't been previously looked at with the depth and understanding that is like relevant to art making today. And I think what you're saying is very true. We are working in this gift economy that at the end of the day, the artist works with a purely um, this kind of evaluation of gratitude to whatever gifts come their way. And that's not because there isn't gratitude, but that also doesn't really look at the fundamentals of art. And I think that art in the recent years has become even more professionalized than ever. And when you think about the professionalization of most other roles in society, we also sort of consider like, okay, how does that person put a roof over their head? How does that person eat? How does that person have a family, X, Y, Z? I think these are questions that are not really asked in the art world. Uh, mm -hmm. And especially not when you look at the funding amounts that are offered to, I would say, 
let's say, middle emerging artists. And I think that we're not looking to replace the systems, um, especially not like on a professional level of curators, programmers, historians, technicians, like these are all extremely valuable roles in the art world. And I would also say that every single art practice is a collaboration between art history and the present day. And then hopefully with whatever you put out today for the future of art. But I think this model of Black Swan is in a sense a speculative model that also similarly does rely on funding bodies that are already existing. For example, we also work with silent stakeholders, which are institutions that are very interested to kind of signal to artists and signal to other institutions that they want to think about these differently. So I would say that like we're kind of more of an adage, particularly mm -hmm. maybe for artists who are working in very new forms of art that particularly hasn't been necessarily understood in the same way as something as weighty as like a painting practice or a sculptural practice. Um, and I think also what we're looking at is particularly artists that are maybe more interested in what art can do on like a socio-political or like a spiritual economy rather than like a kind of marketplace economy. Um, and I think that we've seen like leaps and bounds in these new structures of art making, but we just haven't really kind of pinned that to a funding model that's really working. And I think mm -hmm. that that's sort of what we're interested to do is to play with like what model can actually support these new and diverse practices. Yeah, absolutely. And, and of course, the spiritual economy is, is hard to pay the bills with. And, and that kind of draws in the question um, of Mark from the chat, which is also relates somewhat to a, a, another question proposed by um, uh, the handler Sonic Capybara, which is a kind of rodent, uh, if anyone would like to know. Um, the both questions ask about destabilization in, in different forms and, and how we create a more uh, bottom-up model. Um, Mark, specifically uh, about redistribution in, in a way or distribution of finances. Um, Sid, can you think of any instances uh, or practices that you've been involved with um, at an institutional level where in some way power or finance has been handed over to, to the artist to, um, to become more sustainable or to, to make work in a different model? Um. I guess I want to come at this question in two ways. I, like, I'm a little bit nervous about abstracting to there's a model that is one way or the other because I've worked with producers and curators who take just a, a kind of really interpersonal level. They, they bring a sense that the, the money or the budget that they notionally possess ownership of is not theirs, but collectively belongs to the group of people having a conversation. So I think there's a bit of me that doesn't want to talk in terms of models but almost wants to go like these institutions are groups of people and each of those people have their value systems and i've worked mm -hmm. with producers and curators who guard that money and really wield their power in the room that makes the power balance very clear and i've worked with producers and curators who who make very clear from the beginning of the conversation that that the money doesn't actually belong to them it belongs collectively to to the group of people shaping a project so i guess that's that's one thing I'd want to say. I mean, the other is, I might just talk really personally for a moment. I, I've spent a lot of the last year um, with two other people writing emails and making approaches to people, most of whom have made a living successfully through the cultural and creative industries to donate money to a fund that awards £1,000 grants every month to artists and creative people to realise uh, cultural projects of any kind and at the heart of that is is a really basic sense of needing to and wanting to redistribute funds from those who have managed to make a living through the art world to those who haven't and some of the questions that we're asking ourselves in shaping that are like who are the decision makers we very deliberately 
said, we will have a panel of independent people making those decisions. They won't necessarily be the usual suspects and they'll vary year to year. Um, so I guess I'm wanting to complicate the question by saying, uh, one, that different people have different values in terms of how they relate to money. And two, yeah, I, 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 I think there are ways that you can create small, nimble organizations where you ask questions about the who of every every role that's being done and the amount of power you give those people. And one example that we're trying to do, it's called Grand Plan, is, is really give micro grants and be as human as possible in the process by which they're awarded. Um, yeah, that's, that's some of the places my mind went in answer to Mark and Sonic's questions. Yeah, and that, that somewhat relates to um, that there was a point made during the talk, I think, by Jonathan about when working within an institution, when, when working with the Barbican British Council in, in Jonathan's case, abandoned normal devices in mind, um, there comes with it a cloak of, of perception and, and, a, and a history of what's been done before. Um, do you feel with, within your own work um, that there is enough possibility to keep inspired there, enough possibility within that institution um, or whether in, in the kind of um, yeah the practice of penny there's there's far more possibility in that world of operating outside of that system um, I can only answer that question really personally um, I think the answer varies week to week like and I talk to collaborators about this quite often on projects and I say um, all of us have to constantly ask whether the opportunities afforded by this institutional collaboration outweigh the costs. And I think on projects where it is worth it, it's normally there's an acknowledgement that everyone, the, the online assistant producer, the marketing assistant, the marketing manager, the comms manager, the curator, the producer, the production assistant, the invigilator, the, all of those people collectively shape the conversation that leads to the cultural project that's being made. And the times when it is worth it, I think are the times when all of those people are invested in and, uh, and have been given the agency to and want to shape it. And the times when it feels draining and almost too straining are the times when you feel like you are having to drag or move the machine um, uh, in pursuit of a uh, pursuit of the thing that's getting made. But that is, you know, I, I answer that question differently almost day to day in a given week. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of like my my way of dealing with it to some extent is going, you know, I, I, I make sure I'm doing things separate to the institution and sort of um, like restoring myself in, in smaller scale practices and smaller collaborations where you kind of know the decision that happens in a meeting between two people has to happen. There's no there's no sort of layer and layer and layer. And I think for me, there's a, it's really important to have a bit of that balance within a week. Um, yeah. Yeah. And this, this kind of momentary aspect of, of happiness and temp temporality of like mm. when it's working, I think is really interesting in, in relation to something you said, Penny, about the, the models that you often work with and, and, and trial and propose have various kind of, there's a flux of, of, of temporality from, nine hours to I think you said 38 days was the, the longest um, could you talk a little bit about like whether that's for you the the kind of limit the temporal limit of, of what you do is is inbuilt into that practice and, and whether that's what makes it work because there's no there's no somebody after you there's no somebody before you it's it's built into the model that this is a uh, the uncertainty and, and and the utopia is a moment Mm, that's an interesting question. Um, I guess I guess at once temporality is like a freeing system to like understand that you have like become undone, that you're in state of becoming or unbecoming. But I guess also within that temporality, like one does not have the relief of amnesia. 
So a temporality always has a memory. It always has like a reflection space. But maybe there's something that's more, there's more room to reflect or to remember because there's a, there's a start and there's an end and there's closure and there's a passage of time. And, and I think those kinds of systems for me are very interesting and mostly because I think they sort of also go away, away from our quite like human centric drive of time and that we are taught as a very young age um, that, you know, everything that you do is like basically the, the next stage of your life. It's like we're almost like, you know, remember when you're taking your GCSEs and how like very important they were going to be for the rest of your life. But like really, I, my GCSEs haven't played a huge role in my life. But at one point, I thought that they were going to dictate my pension. You know, so I think like maybe this, like getting away from this kind of pressure and allowing the affordance of play or the affordance or luxury of a weightlessness. And I think maybe that's what temporality allows one to do. Mm -hmm. And speaking of weightlessness, uh, sorry, my daughter is joining me. You might be able to see her. Um, Obviously, it said you, you operate within a, a, an institution that has physical limits to what is possible mm. there. It, it, it has a, a purposeful um, building designated to different historic disciplines of what art can be. Um, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the, the kind of weight of a building uh, and the weight of um, yeah. possibility that that brings to you or, or limitation. Yeah, it's a super interesting question, Luke. Um, so the bit of the building that I work with is is the void that exists between those um, those art forms. So for those who don't know the Barbican, there's there's a there's a thousand seat theatre, a two thousand seat concert hall, two huge art galleries, cinemas, and but between all of those are these cavernous foyers, and they they've always been a little bit of a a void that they. They're the negative space that exists between each of those art forms. And those art forms carry with them a weight and a history. And this void in between um, has less of it. And I've always been drawn to the void. Um, and I think I, I have been in institutions. I think in all institutions, there are voids and there are edges. And they've got a slightly different energy and a slightly more... You, yeah, it's almost for me they're almost always the gap between what a place says it wants to be and what its organizational structure allows it to be and i think in the barbican that's made manifest in in these in-between spaces in the middle and rather than seeing the building as a burden i kind of this comes back to why i was talking about intervention before like that that void is full of like toddlers parents kids like architecture students like situations like yours right now is what's happening in there they're they're beautifully chaotic and and if faced with a context like that that is in motion and is unpredictable um you have to be much more the work that gets designed has to sit alongside that chaos and know that people are going to stumble <laughs> <laughs> they're going to stumble upon it. The, you know, you're not going to be able to control it. You're not going to be able to control the threshold. People won't have made the active choice to be confronted by your interpretive text. They will see it whilst they're doing something else. And I think that that's a much, like for me, that's really exciting. It poses questions about um, how do you want someone to feel if they weren't interested in it, but they walked by. I mean, I, you must face so many of these challenges with some of the places that you develop work for and in. I think, um, so I guess my relationship to the building is kind of going, multitudes of people are already there. They're living their lives. Um, if you're going to cite work that coexists alongside those lives, then what does it need to do to draw them in and sit alongside rather than compete with it? Um, so yeah, that's, I think that's my, that's my relationship to building. I, and I, I feel like many of these places have voids, either conceptual or real, a bit like that and lots of the opportunity for inventive work lies in them. 
Thank you. And we have um, no more questions in the chat at the moment. We are coming towards our, our 20 minute mark. Um, I'd like to, to thank you both for joining us this evening. It's been a, a, a really incredible opportunity to get to know both your practices, also Jonathan uh, and Razier, and I hope we can continue these, these conversations going forwards. And as we spoke about, uh, or rather you spoke about during the, the broadcast, perhaps behind, behind closed doors too, and, and perhaps there's more of a need for us to come together like this um, through the year uh, and going forward to, to rethink this world that we're working together in. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, Lou. Bye bye. The box and Thank <laughs> you.